Right now, there are hundreds of programs within the federal government that are unauthorized. They are on autopilot. They are runaway programs that haven't been reviewed, reauthorized by the people's representatives in Congress, in some cases for decades. A few years ago, Jake Tapper called these unauthorized programs zombie programs. And it's a perfect description. Now, I just learned that it's actually Kevin Kosar who, who originally called them zombie programs, and you're going to hear from him a little bit after me. Uh, but these zombie programs account for a roughly $310 billion in government spending. That's hundreds of billions of dollars. And often, it's part of the untold frustration that we often hear from the, the citizens, the hardworking taxpayers that we represent. Congress isn't using its power to exercise the power of the purse to hold these programs accountable on a regular basis, and it needs to change. So that's why I have introduced, and I'm leading the USA Act. The USA Act will sunset zombie spending. It will require the people's representatives to re review, rethink, or possibly eliminate government programs that no longer serve their mission. It would really give us a chance, well, it would in ensure that we're doing our job to rethink, review, bring these programs into, into the 21st century at times, and make sure that every dollar is spent wisely. First, it requires Congress to either end or reauthorize programs that do not have current reauthorizations, enforcing this requirement through an annual spending cut for three years. On the third year, if the program has not been reauthorized, then it will sunset. The USA Act lays out a fiscally sound but feasible schedule for the federal bureaucracy to defend their need for taxpayer dollars. It provides flexibility for authorizers to get their work done while maintaining spending discipline. And because Congress is reviewing programs, it ensures that necessary programs are improved and updated. You know, we all hear the frustration. People are frustrated by out of control spending. They're, they're frustrated by record debt record deficits, and they're frustrated because their elected representatives seem powerless at times against the unelected bureaucrats in the executive branch and judges who legislate from the bench. There's a breakdown of trust as people see so much government waste, no accountability, and agencies that have lost sight of their mission. My goal with the USA Act is to rein in this runaway zombie spending and ensure that the American people can trust they are empowered through their elected representatives who are doing their jobs. It's a good government solution to restore the separation of powers. Article 1 gives Congress the exclusive power to write laws and set the funding priorities. Our founders established this by design. They put decision-making power where it's closest and most accountable to we the people. And that's what makes America the greatest experiment in self-governance the world has ever known. To keep this experiment alive, Congress needs to rebuild trust, restore our Article I power, and keep decision-making closest to the people. A good way to start is by putting an end to these zombies that are feasting off a broken, broken spending process in Congress. I'm grateful to my friends and colleagues in the Senate for this opportunity to highlight the USA Act with all of you. I hope we can continue to work together on more solutions to to restore the power of the purse, bring accountability, and rein in government spending. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I think we promised not to ask questions, but what if we broke our promise and asked one or two? They're yes. friendly questions, yes. at least mine. Yes, were. Yours yes. Were friendly too. But anyway, the uh, do you have a Democrat co-sponsor? Uh, I'm working on it. Okay. And uh, we've done the same. We've reintroduced yes. a similar bill, and we haven't had one yet. Um, have you gotten feedback from the other side as far as whether or not you have a chance or what the obstacles are? Right. You know, uh, I've worked on this legislation now for several years. We introduced it first, I believe it was two Congresses ago, and, and just continuing to build awareness, build support. Uh, you know, there's some hesitancy putting Congress on this schedule, but I believe that we need that. We need something that's going to force Congress to make the tough decisions. Yeah, and I guess my point is we look back to William Proxmire, who was a Democrat, who pointed out these sort of wasteful projects from back in the 70s, and we said, why are we still doing this? And part of the answer, at least, is maybe we don't relook at these programs and see where we're spending the money, and we've given away the authority. Uh, yes, and, it, and it's an opportunity for us to update, you know, to, to a program that was put in place in the, in the 90s, you know, it was a very different time in the 90s. 
than where we are in 2019. So it's absolutely important that we are updating these programs, looking through the lens of 2019, and how often do we meet with someone that's working within the federal government that feels like their hands are tied? You know, they're saying, well, this is the law, these are the rules, we, can't, we don't have the flexibility to do what we really should be doing within this program or this agency. That's where if Congress was actually doing this on a more regular basis and uh, making sure that it's not decades, that go by before a program is reviewed, re, you know, we th rethink it. Uh, it would also empower uh, those that are, are really working hard on the front lines and, and want to spend taxpayer dollars wisely. Well, I just uh, thank you for your testimony and for your work and interest in this area. I share a lot of the concerns uh, that you outlined. I probably uh, have a different approach in terms of uh, how you might go about holding programs accountable and making decisions about reauthorization, one of which, uh, and it may not be a different approach, but I wonder what you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Shaheen, my senior senator, and I uh, are both on a, a bill in the past uh, that would do federal budgeting much more like the way states do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we would suggest biennial budgeting, so in the first year you actually appropriate funds and authorize programs. The second year of the biennium, you'd actually have metrics and you'd be measuring the programs against those metrics, looking at how they work, and then that would inform the budgeting mm -hmm. process the next year. Does that sound like something we could find bipartisan support for? Yes, uh, there there has been similar legislation introduced in the House. Yep. Uh, it is part of a, a, a package that I think many members, bipartisan, believe would, would help bring accountability. Uh, I have supported that proposal yeah. in the House. Uh, I would still come back to the fact that years go by, decades go by, and you, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of programs, agencies, departments that are on autopilot, that continue to get funded every year, whether it's Understood. one year or two years, without Congress really bringing them in and saying, okay, uh, we need to make sure that you're, re you're authorized and reauthorized, and in in, in don't let those deadlines go by. We often, right. we, often they have deadlines, but we've just allowed those deadlines to go by. And, and just one other comment on that would be that we have groups of people we call appropriators, and then there's the rest of us. Right. And so they tend to have all of this power, and it's supposed to be somewhat split with authorizers right. who are supposed to watch the appropriators, and then there'd be more of a check and a balance. And so I think we need to figure out a way. And all I would say from my point of view is if, if there was a, something that we could find agreement on to figure out how to force authorization, the details of my bill, I'm open to, to right. compromising Understood. on it if we could find a common ground. Yeah, we really need to figure out that piece between the appropriators and the authorizers because the appro yes, I thought that was, yeah, we need to figure out. That's the, the piece that I, I believe is missing. And this is one well, attempt. Thank you. Okay, no, thank I'm, you. I'm good. Thank you for coming over. Yeah, good to be with you. We'll go ahead and have the second panel come forward, and I think we'll start with our opening statements now. We're here the day before Halloween to talk about zombies. These are not the kind of zombies we see on The Walking Dead or what we might see on our doorstep tomorrow evening. In many ways, these zombies are far scarier. These are zombie government programs that have sometimes not been reauthorized for decades. Since the mid-19th century and reaffirmed in the 74 Budget Act, Congress separated spending bills from the authority, and we were supposed to have checks and balance between appropriators and authorizers. In recent decades, though, Congress has failed in its oversight by not reauthorizing the programs it creates. So what are these zombie programs? There are programs Congress created long ago that have since expired and yet somehow live on, continuing to receive appropriations. How big is the problem? Some might say, well, surely it can't be more than a few dozen programs or maybe just a few million dollars. Actually, it's over 1,000 programs and $300 billion. It's a huge problem. What are these zombie programs? Some are ridiculous and well out of date. For example, the Inter-American Foundation spent taxpayer dollars on such things as a clown college in Argentina, welfare in Brazil, and jump-starting the Haitian film industry. When I point these things out, people always ask me how such ridiculous things continue to get funded. Part of the answer is unauthorized spending. The Inter-America Foundation was created in the 1960s and last authorized more than 30 years ago. 
It is no wonder a lot of people ask, what is the Inter-American Foundation? It's not just bad programs, though. There's a lot of conversation these days about election security. But it would surprise people to learn that the Federal Election Commission was last reauthorized in the 1980s, before there was the internet or electronic voting machines. That means the FEC does not have the proper powers or authorities or guidance to address current needs. Or worse, they're making up their own rules as they go. I put forward a solution, a zombie cure, called the Legislative Performances Review Act. This bill would require programs to be reauthorized every four years, creates a targeted point of order against funding such programs, and it provides for an orderly wind down of exp expired programs, and it asks committees to consider performance evaluations, which Congress has been mandating, but ignoring for the past 25 years when authorizing programs. Some say that sufficient oversight happens in the spending committees from the appropriators. I just don't think that's true. If we were to look at this program and look at this problem, I think we really have to have uh, some sort of parameters that force authorization to happen or some kind of punishment uh, to the program that doesn't allow it to continue on. So I, for one, think there's a need for reform. I also am very open to compromising with anyone on the Democrat side who wants to have reform to figure this is something eminently we could compromise on if we can find common ground. Thank you, and with that, I recommend, recognize Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your work and your staff's work on this hearing, <laughs> and I also want to thank the witnesses for being here today to provide their expertise on these issues. Today's hearing focuses on the issue of government spending on programs that have expired and that Congress has failed to reauthorize, but they continue to operate through mandates and appropriations bills. Earlier this year, the Congressional Budget Office reported that in fiscal year 2019, 971 programs continue to operate despite an expired authorization of appropriations. These programs cost $307 billion and accounted for roughly 25 percent of all discretionary funding in fiscal year 2019. There are critically important programs among those identified by the CBO. These are large programs like medical services and hospital care for veterans and those established under the Violence Against Women's Act, as well as smaller programs dedicated to civil rights, environmental protection, and the promotion of science and the arts. These programs are vital to the health and safety of our constituents, and that is all the more reason that they should be subject to congressional oversight through the reauthorization process so we can be assured that they are working as Congress intended and so that we can identify opportunities for improvement. I'm proud to have introduced and supported a number of bipartisan bills to help Congress fulfill its oversight duties in an efficient, data-driven way, including the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, Taxpayers' Right to Know Act, and the Duplication Scoring Act of 2019, which Chairman Paul and I introduced earlier this year. While I believe that authorizing committees should periodically review programs, I disagree with the premise that programs should automatically lapse or wind down if that does not happen, even when Congress agrees to fund them. It would do enormous harm to our constituents if programs to provide medical services to veterans or to combat violence against women ended because Congress appropriated funding but failed to authorize the programs. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and most importantly, I hope our witnesses can help us to identify ways to continue to improve congressional processes in order to safeguard taxpayers' dollars while ensuring that Congress continues to support essential programs that serve the American people and that the American people support. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and to the witnesses for your attendance. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, this is our second panel, and our first witness on the second panel is Mr. Kevin Kosar. Mr. Kosar is a Vice President of Policy at the R Street Institute, overseeing all the think tank's research. He also co-directs the nonpartisan Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, which aims to strengthen Congress. Mr. Kosar is the co-editor of the book, Congress Overwhelmed the Decline in Congressional Capacity and Prospects for Reform. His writing has appeared in academic journals as well as the New York Times, Politico, and the Washington Post. Mr. Kosar holds a BA from, the Ohio, from Ohio State University and a doctorate in politics from New York University. Mr. Kosar, you are recognized for your opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman Paul. 
uh, Ranking Member Hassan and members of the subcommittee for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify. Uh, this is an important issue. I uh, began writing about it a few years ago, and I was just alarmed by what I was seeing, uh, namely that it is a problem which continues to grow, but Congress has really struggled to prioritize it as a problem and to devise ways to deal with it. Now, as, as mentioned already, this past uh, March, CBO reported that there were 971 expired authorizations of appropriations, and those can be found in 257 laws. And at the time, they amounted to about $158 billion in annual funding. But most recently, uh, Congress appropriated some $307 billion towards those same programs. So it's almost as if those authorizations in statute are just irrelevant. They might as well not be written law. Uh, but they are law, and law is supposed to matter. So we have a lot of zombie programs. We have a lot of spending. And for sure, the rise in unauthorized appropriations are a symptom of a broken uh, congressional budget process. They also reflect uh, general struggles that our legislature is having in the 21st century. But I wouldn't want to wave away zombie programs as just a symptom. I think they are, in and of themselves, troubling and problematic, and I've got four reasons for saying that. You know, first of which is Congress is just not following the plan it set out in the 74 Budget Act. That law said authorize then appropriate. That's the law. Not following the law doesn't look good to anyone, so far as I can tell. The second, the rise of zombie programs gives the appearance that Congress is abdicating its oversight duties because it creates programs, says that it's only going to spend money at certain levels for a certain number of years, and then proceeds to disregard that. Government watchdogs and citizens would be forgiven for wondering whether if Congress has checked out and just abdicated its power over the public's money. Third, if Congress is not reforming these programs through reauthorizations, it raises the specter of anachronism. We may have federal programs that we do not need. We probably do. These programs should be deauthorized and defunded. Additionally, not reauthorizing statutes may mean we have federal programs that are needed, that are important, but they're designed to solve the problems of yesteryear, or they may be designed in a way to use the techniques of yesteryear. In both these scenarios, needless to say, um, are the antithesis of evidence-based policy making, which is something that Congress has been moving towards over the recent years. Fourth and finally, failing to reauthorize programs delegates legislative authority to the executive branch. In short, agencies themselves get to decide what the law means, what the program should do, and where the money goes. Now, the growth in unauthorized appropriations has been fueled by a whole lot of factors that I allude to in my written testimony. Some are way beyond the control of Congress, like polarization. One factor that gets less consideration than I think it should is insufficient congressional capacity vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch. Consider the executive branch has perhaps 180 agencies which administer untold thousands of statutes and programs. The sheer giganticism of the executive branch has utterly outstripped Congress's ability to oversee it. Uh, CBO said that in FY 2019 alone, there were 130 expiring authorizations for appropriations. That's a lot of laws to review and update. That's a huge workload. But Congress's capacity hasn't kept up with it. It's flagged, and in some cases, if you look at the House particularly, it's gone down. Um, the number of congressional staff has certainly kept up, not kept up. We know their workhorses in helping do oversight. Um, and the amount of time Congress is in session today and able to hold hearings is about the same as it was in 1969. Those are divergent trends, to put it mildly. But I would also say that when it comes to dealing with, uh, with unauthorized appropriations, congressional capacity is a key piece. You gotta have the resources, but it's not enough. You gotta have will. Um, there is, in the 74 law, a kind of eat your spinach aspect to the reauthorization process. You know, you should do it. It's the right thing to do. It's proper budgeting technique. That's, that's in there. But what's the incentive to doing it? Clearly, members of Congress, many of them may feel personally that it's worth doing, but they don't bother to do it because it's hard work and it's often unrewarded. So in looking towards reform, my general advice is it would be great to tackle uh, zombie appropriations and to reduce them, uh, and that it should be a two-pronged strategy. You need capacity, and you also need to make sure that members of Congress have the incentive to get it done. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Kozar. Our next witness is Jonathan Bidlack. Mr. Bidlack is founder and president of the Institute for Spending Reform and the Coalition to Reduce Spending, which raises awareness about the need for responsible fiscal policy and balanced budgets. Mr. Bidlack's work on spending reform has been featured in columns ranging from Business Insider to Reason Magazine to the Washington Examiner. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Princeton University. Mr. Bidlack, your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking members of the subcommittee um, for the opportunity to speak with you today. It's no secret that over time, Congress has found it easier and easier to ignore the budgetary instructions that lawmakers have set for themselves. Most Americans, and certainly the members on the subcommittee, are familiar with the devolution of the budgeting process into temporary stopgaps, onerous omnibus legislation, and even shutdowns that have become a part of modern government. But often lost in the noise over appropriation standoffs is the fact that the other side of that proverbial coin, budgetary authorizations, what's meant to be the first step, has been increasingly ignored. What's supposed to be a two-step process in which programs are first authorized before funding is appropriated now works more often than not by ignoring that first step entirely. As we've already talked about, uh, in 2019, Congress spent about $307 billion on nearly 1,000 agencies and programs that were no longer authorized. This is about 23% of the discretionary budget, but those numbers look even worse when you consider that every year we, we reauthorize the entire Pentagon budget in one bill. So uh, that's half of discretionary spending. So that means that for all other discretionary spending, more than half is going unauthorized on an annual basis. Uh, as the chart I illustrate, I, I uh, put in my written testimony illustrates, despite some blips up and down, the trend has been unmistakably been moving in the wrong direction. Uh, for comparison, unauthorized spending in the early 1990s hovered under 10% of the discretionary budget. Today, we're at uh, typically more than a quarter. Uh, many specific programs haven't been authorized, as we've touched on. My personal favorite is the, the Federal Election Commission, just because it hasn't been reauthorized since two years before I was born, since 1981. So why does this matter? Well, at a basic level, separating uh, authorizations and appropriations is meant to reflect what I think we would all agree is a generally good practice, which is you should have a plan for spending money before you actually allocate the funds. And this is an idea that, that dates back to the founding of our republic. And unfortunately, Congress in recent years has not really seemed to agree. And I think you know, contemporary lawmakers will say that it's because uh, you know, they, they avoid these, these uh, authorization procedures, perhaps out of a desire to avoid what could be messy debate uh, and could halt critical programs. But I think equally likely is an assumption that it's not worth the burden of the reauthorization process when we have agencies that are operating without authorization and there seem not to be any adverse consequences. But just because we don't see those consequences openly, perhaps, uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. Skipping authorization can mean that programs intended to sunset continue past their expiration dates while no one's the wiser. Whether government programs operate well is harder to know when Congress doesn't take the time to reevaluate the worthiness of their existence. Even if only one program were, uh, were being allowed to exist beyond its usefulness, no proponent of good government would say it's acceptable to let that situation continue without oversight. Abdicating responsibility in one area of the budgeting process makes it easier to abdicate responsibility elsewhere. The issue of unauthorized appropriations can't be easily separated from the other budgetary problems the nation currently faces. Unauthorized appropriations may not represent the entirety of the federal budget or even of the discretionary budget, but that doesn't mean we should forego the opportunity to reevaluate and reform this $300 billion and counting. Consider that re resources are limited, and in an era of tight budgets and worsening debt, a billion or even a million dollars misspent can represent dollars stripped away from critical national priorities or the taxpayers' wallets. Now, critics may argue that regardless whether appropriations are authorized, there's already plenty of accountability over where Congress and subsequently agencies and departments spend taxpayer funds. I think this view is overly optimistic at best, but consider an analogy that may be appropriate. In 2001, Congress passed the authorization for a use of military force in Afghanistan. And in the years since, many, including some on this subcommittee, have called for a new vote, arguing that the 18-year-old AUMF should hardly provide a blank check for today's overseas engagements. In such discussions, few accept the argument that because there are other ways of ensuring wartime accountability, that we shouldn't bother following the rules or reassessing the original authorization. It's my contention that the same should hold true in the case of fiscal rules as well. If Congress, at the time of originally authorizing a program or agency, does so for a specified period of time, we should respect those wishes in the name of ensuring the most efficient use of the societal resources that we have at our disposal. If the rules are arcane or no longer useful, certainly one can argue there are plenty to which that description applies. The correct solution is to change them, to update them, not to ignore them indefinitely. 
Tackling the current problem requires both addressing the existing programs with expired authorizations and reforming the process to ensure that kind of spending stops going forward. A couple of principles that, that we may want to consider. There should be a meaningful enforcement mechanism so that unauthorized spending does not continue unchecked as it has for decades. Recent legislation, such as that by Representative McMorris Rogers, proposed a, a combination of sunset provisions and a rolling sequester to gradually reduce the amount of unauthorized spending. I think that's a good suggestion. There also must be broader and more, ho broader and more holistic effort to return this body to be a deliberative budgeting entity. Legislators ultimately have responsibility for making budgeting decisions rather than having them arise as a de facto product of political chaos. Every federal agency is supposed to operate under congressional authorization. These are the rules that define the priorities and activities of the government. When they expire, there comes a time to reconsider an agency's mission, modernize or end them if, if applicable, and impose some accountability onto the process instead of abdicating responsibility to open-ended spending. Reforming unauthorized appropriations is a great place to start evaluating government spending more broadly. Doing so shouldn't be viewed as a cure-all for our budget woes, but as an untapped area of potential reform. So I applaud the subcommittee's willingness to hold this hearing and explore solutions before the issue becomes even more manageable and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Our, our last witness today is Dr. James Thurber. Dr. Thurber is the Distinguished Professor of Government at American University. He's also the founder of the Center for Congressional and Professional Studies and the affiliate Distinguished Professor of Public Administration and Policy at American University. Since 1976, he has worked for several members of Congress on issues including budget process reform and congressional committee reorganization. Professor Thurber holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Oregon and a PhD in political science from Indiana University. Uh, Professor Thurber. Thank you very much, Chairman Paul. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Ranking Member Hassan, uh, Hassan, sorry, <laughs> uh, and other members of the, uh, of the subcommittee. I, I have a statement here that I was going to read. I'm not going to do that. I just want to say a few things. I, I first started working uh, in the Senate in 1973. I was here for the 74 Budget and Public Control Act and worked on it. I've written about it, written a lot about it, the failures of it. Uh, it's only passed four times on time since 1976 when we fully implemented it. That's part of this problem. Uh, secondly, I worked for, I was a professional staff member on the Bipartisan Temporary Select Committee on the study of the Senate committee system. That was the last time we reduced the number of committees, realigned assignments, uh, uh, jurisdictions, and uh, uh, reduced committee assignments, and it worked pretty well for a while. Uh, it, the discussion brought back discussions that we had on that committee. Uh, the chairs were Adlai Stevenson and, and Bill Brock. Um, we talked about merging appropriations with authorizations, very controversial thing. In my opinion, yeah, but in my opinion, the appropriators have, have taken over the power of authorizers, uh, totally. And, and uh, again, just to summarize some of my thoughts uh, here rather than reading it, I think that this is a consequence of extreme partisanship and gridlock and the leadership is controversial, but the leadership doesn't give the committees the incentive and the freedom to do the kind of oversight that they should be doing. Secondly, the budget for the committees are not there. They're, they're uh, part of the reform uh, in 76 that we had was that we had, we asked committees to have a, an agenda, an oversight agenda, and that, they, that the committees would get money related to uh, the oversight that they they were doing and what they did. I suggest that we changing the rules may not work immediately, but there are a bunch of things that we can do, you can do in the interim. One is go back to the regular order. Easy to say, uh, you know, take a little bit of power away from the leadership, give more power to the chairs of the committees, let them work their will, because some committees are quite bipartisan, by the way. Uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee is well known for being quite bipartisan. I think your committee is also. Uh, and they can work their will. They can get some things done. Secondly, uh, I think it should be required that every committee should have a list of all the unauthorized programs within their jurisdiction. And it should be part of their website. And it should maybe create a way to motivate the committee to do a little bit more on that. Third. Um, Authorizers sometimes don't want to uh, pass a bill because they can't get exactly what they want, and so there are these 
unholy alliances with appropriators. You know about it. Maybe you're involved with it. I don't know. But <laughs> where you can't we're get not, something. We're not in any unholy alliance. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> where you can't get something in, through authorization, so you do a non-transparent agreement, uh, a quid pro quo? No. Uh, a, a transparent agreement with the appropriators, and they take care of that little problem that you have. Right. Make those things more uh, visible uh, to the American public. I think that the basic work of the institution is not getting done, and we can't blame it all on polarization and all on the leadership. Uh, uh, some of it's you, uh, the Tuesday Thursday Club. Now, I know you don't belong to the Tuesday Thursday Club, but people in the permanent campaign that's going on, and all the people running for the presidency now is something else, but the permanent campaign, they're out uh, bringing in money, helping others bring in money, and they're not here doing their work. If they're here doing their work, and the leadership tries to do this three weeks on, one week in the, in the district, uh, I think you would get much more done. That, that reform has been around since the, since the late 60s, and we can't seem to deal with it. Um, the funding of these committees um, should be uh, directly linked to their productivity. Uh, and maybe, again, as I said before, we, we would get uh, more done. I believe in biennial, biennial budgeting. I have published about that. We really have it anyway. Only about 10 percent of the budget of the, of the federal government is controllable from year to year. That means you've got multi-year budgeting going on anyway. So I would uh, uh, push for that. In conclusion, uh, unauthorized spending is a symptom of a broader dysfunction in the budget process and in Congress general, generally. And, in, and the inability of Congress in the absent, absence of a hardworking partisan center. I'm from Oregon. We believe in sort of radical centrist positions. Uh, if you don't have a, a bipartisan center, you can't effectively deal with problems uh, like uh, oversight of these authorizations. Uh, no wonder the public is dissatisfied with what you're doing. No wonder you're at the 14 percent level. But the public also wants you to confront the opposition. The Pew Charitable Trust poll of October 19th shows that, you, boy, they really want you to do more and get along and compromise, but they want you to stand up against the opposition. So they want to go to heaven without dying, really, and you've got to deal with that. In conclusion, my recommendations are not radical. Uh, I think they're practical. Uh, and, but you need to bring the leadership in on this and get them to agree uh, with this. Now, that doesn't mean, Senator, that I'm against your bill. I'm just trying to be uh, realistic about some procedural things that can be done here to help out. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I think probably there's some agreement on both sides of the aisle and among the panel and probably the public that we probably should authorize, you know, what we spend and maybe yeah. that having authorization bills and appropriation bills is a good idea. I worry about making them the same people uh, and putting them all in the same hands because they're different types of personalities. At least on the Republican side, we see the appropriators as people who are more inclined to spend money we don't have, and those of us who are not on the appropriation committees are purposely not put on the appropriations committee because we won't vote for the spending. So really, when you come to Washington, a selection process on our side is made. Spenders, people who are willing to vote for spending are put on the spending committees. The people who are less inclined or think we spend too much or that our budget should be balanced are not put on there. So our only chance to get balance from the Republican perspective would be to have authorization separate from, from uh, appropriation. You mentioned the Budget Act of um, 74. Not only have we had the Budget Act of 74, we had Graham Rudman Hollings, pay as you go. We've had all of these things to try to reform at least the accumulation of debt, and they've all failed. And uh, I guess it's because lawmakers make laws, they can also ignore their own laws, and we simply have. I think at one count, pay as you go had been ignored thousands of times, you know, and so. That gets to the next question, and that's the real pertinent question here. How do, you, how do you force Congress to do what they should be doing? You can encourage them to do it, but I think that's why I'm for a bill that has a hammer. Now, there may be some disagreement on what the hammer is, but I'm willing to compromise on what the hammer is. Um, if there's concern about a program completely expiring, let's take that off the table. We have 
significant cuts. You know, we have like 20% uh, cut after the first year if it's not authorized, then 52% cut. Maybe that's way too dramatic, but if, if you were willing or the other side was willing to agree to some kind of hammer, maybe it's a 1% cut or maybe it's a freeze. Even a freeze would be, don't you think people would go crazy with a freeze around here, you know? Even if we froze spending at the last year's level, people go, oh my goodness, the world's coming to an end. We can't have a freeze. So I would think that number would be negotiable, what the hammer is. If that isn't the hammer that's acceptable, though, I guess my question for the panel would be, um, how do we get Congress to obey this? Do we need a hammer? And what should the hammer be? And if the hammer isn't reducing spending, are there other possible hammers? Uh, both my bill and McMorris Rogers have the hammer is reducing spending if you don't authorize it. Why don't we start with Mr. Kozar and we'll work our way down. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's some value in having uh, a statutory source of pressure and what you just alluded to, like, okay, it's not reauthorized, well, you're, you're frozen. Nothing dramatic, but it does start to create pressure that over time would hopefully induce some sort of action. Um, I think also the idea of in some way linking committee budgets to reauthorizations and reauthorizations performance, I think that would be very interesting. I can say that in the in, in the early 70s, when Congress really seized back a bunch of power, um, it created, you know, start of each Congress, it was like, hey, we are creating plans for doing oversight. And they worked the process. I mean, that was the era of joint committee reports being issued. I mean, they took it seriously. But over time, that sort of attitude has fallen away. And we can't just kind of wave our fingers at them and chastise them and say, do this more. Uh, the personal incentives just don't seem to be there. So, okay, let's use something simpler, more funding. Uh, that may be another way to go. Yeah, I think, uh, as I said in my remarks, I think you need to have some sort of enforcement mechanism. You know, you can pass whatever rule you want, but if there's no way of actually enforcing, uh, then then it's not really going to make much of a difference. And, you know, I would say broadly speaking on budgetary issues, if you look at what's done in the states or even in some other countries, it's those, it's those places that have some sort of firm enforcement mechanism that tend to have more responsible finances. Um, you know, if you look at fiscal rules in Sweden or Switzerland, for example, you know, we sort of, we forget about this. I mean, Sweden had an entitlement crisis and they put in place a statutory regime that, um, you know, obviously they weren't dealing with the problem of unauthorized appropriations, but um, they put in place very, very stringent rules that dictated what uh, their their government was able to spend, and as a result, they had more responsible fiscal outcomes, uh, both in times of economic well-being and economic distress. And so, um, I think with any problem like this that's budgetarily related, uh, the, at, at the core has to be some way of actually ensuring that uh, that future Congresses will actually follow that rule. And I should say one other point: you know, political political scientists often say that. Um, you know, there's no way of binding future Congresses, but in a sense, that's kind of what we're what we're doing here by by not following through on um, on on tackling unauthorized appropriations. We basically have past Congresses that are authorizing programs, and then today we're just deciding that we're gonna we're gonna follow those same rules. We're essentially assuming that Congress itself is being bound by these past rules. Um, we don't really accept that in other areas. I think here we we probably would best not to as well. Professor Thurber, you get a double, we're going to double down on you because you get to answer the question on how do we get Congress to authorize and how do we get them to obey the 74 Budget Act. Since you helped write it, how do we get a Congress to obey it? I have to take pharmaceuticals when I look at how badly it's been implemented. <laughs> I have a whole history of the dysfunction. That's not failure. the answer. We want the answer. How do you enforce Congress to, to, to pay attention to it? Uh, first of all, I like the idea of a hammer uh, and freezing a program. You cannot zero out veterans programs or violence against women's program. I mean, maybe you could, but I think it's unreasonable, uh, or NASA or all these others. I think you, you, know, you have to send a message that if you don't get your act together, uh, you know, we're going we're to uh, have a, a, a leveling out, a freezing of the program. I like that. By the way, it was mentioned that things were better in the 70s, and I have a whole book on this about polarization it, and where it came from and its impact. And in the 70s, we had about a third of the House and the Senate that voted together. And we had Bellman and Muskie, chair of the Budget Committee, that were two former governors. Uh, 
Now, former governors know how budgets are put together, and they did a great job. They had a bipartisan approach. They did a great job, better than the House, for the first four years. Uh, so personality makes a difference, but also the nature of who's in the body makes a difference. Right now, we have 4 percent of the members that regularly vote together. We have a bimodal distribution of ideology, nobody in the middle. And that's one of the reasons why we can't get the work done. But that's why I gave you these sort of incremental, not very sexy ideas about changing the process, getting them to work, getting people together in committees to, you know, to talk with each other and work uh, problems out. That's not really going on. So the Budget Impoundment Control Act, um, whenever it failed, they changed the rules. You mentioned three of them. Uh, and that, that continually goes on. It's going on this year. You know, when you have a when you have an omnibus CR going on, it's really sort of changing the rules. Um, Just to interrupt you for a second, yeah. we actually, every time, a lot of people don't realize this, whenever we pass CRs, we have to pass an exemption to a lot of the rules you're talking about. So I think the pay-as-you-go is a rule. We're supposed it to is. absolutely pay, do that. We exempt ourselves from it every time we vote for a CR. It's in the right. language. A former student of mine helped write that as a staff member. I'm very proud of that. The one thing I do know is I teach my students about how bad the debt and the deficit is and how this is failing and that they should get engaged up here as staff members. And I, I have over 180 former uh, students up here as staff members and four members of Congress. Some of the members of Congress have forgotten what they learned in my class, maybe. But uh, I hope I've answered your question. I don't think I did, but yeah. <laughs> Senator Hassan. Well, I want to thank you again, uh, Senator Paul, for uh, convening this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for your um, very insightful and thoughtful testimony. Um, Dr. Thurber, I want to drill down a little bit with you, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask these questions, and then I'm going to apologize because I'm supposed to check in at one more hearing uh, before we have a, a, a meeting. Um, but Dr. Thurber, I have real concerns that we've all talked about with the Senate's with our lack of authorization, to be sure, but real concerns with the Senate's failure to take up attempts to reauthorize appropriations for some of the government's most important programs. And you just talked about a couple of them. For example, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act passed the House in April. So it actually, the House actually has reauthorized it. And it contains a number of provisions that reauthorize expired programs that provide vital services for all Americans. But it is now stalled on the Senate floor. Can you elaborate? You, you talked about uh, the, the attractiveness of, of some sort of hammer or consequence, but I think it's really important when we talk in the abstract about that to also talk about the harm that results from not reauthorizing these programs. Can you elaborate on what not reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act would, what kind of impact that would have? Well, it would cut off well, first of all, it's disruptive in terms of running a program. Right. You as the governor understand that. Yeah. I've worked with Sandia and uh, Lab in Los Alamos, and when, you know, when the government shuts down or it looks like they're not going to be funded, you know, the Energy Department yeah. last authorized 1984, it really disrupts things. It's the same with, uh, with the VAWA, and those programs are very important to not only women but to elderly. Uh, to a variety of uh, local um, groups that are that are helping uh, right. people that are in in danger, uh, the stalker reduction database gets shut down, right. and you have to get started again. The sexual assault services programs throughout the United States, and right now that's really sort of an important topic, right. yeah. uh, and it's really sending the wrong message. Uh, but there is an elder abuse uh, grant program that would get cut off, so. The question is, if you're running a program and you've got these goals and objectives and, you, and it looks like you're not going to get the money, it just doesn't work. It would, yeah. you, know, you go up and down like this. And the governors know this. The city managers know this. The NACO, National Council. Yeah, and it, and it gets very hard to um, recruit and retain critical staff uh, to do things like help people who are in danger. Um, uh, another Senator, example. Senator, if I could just yeah. mention one thing. Sometimes these programs have one or two provisions that hold up the authorization. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that, Senator Paul, maybe you're, you're not for this. I'll just assume that you are for many of these programs. But they're very narrow provisions that are extremely controversial, and it holds it up. 
And that's where you got to get together and you got to compromise. Right. And that's not going on. Right. And, but in some cases, so we have the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, which passed the House and is stalled over here. Um, another example is the Nelson and Pollard Intelligence Authorization Act, which would reauthorize funding for uh, the intelligence activities of 16 different agencies. This authorization expired in, 27, in 2017. The bill passed the House 397 to 31, right. a huge bipartisan vote, but has yet to be acted upon in the Senate. A failure to reauthorize intelligence activities would certainly have an effect on our national security. So would you, Dr. Thurber, suggest what would you do to encourage Congress to pursue proactive reauthorizations? I would suggest that the caucuses, both caucuses, really push their leadership to do something about this. These, yeah. these things are not going forward frequently because the leadership doesn't want them to go forward because they think they have a consensus of the caucus. Sometimes they don't. Many times the, both parties would like to have things go forward, but the leadership is, is in the way. I know that's easy to say, uh, and in an election year, it's very hard, uh, you know, every two years, it's very hard to get them to, to move. But remember, the House is democratic, and it's pretty progressive, liberal, and so, you know, passing this act maybe is something that the Republican leadership just doesn't want to touch uh, in an election year. Um, which I understand, but it passed 397 to 31. I know. <laughs> so, so let's, I mean, and, and I have one more question that I do want to get to, but I also just want to point out, when we talk about winding down programs that haven't been reauthorized, perhaps the most startling one to me as a relatively new member of the Senate is that the spending authorizations for medical services and hospital care for our veterans right. expired in 1998. And to my knowledge, no bill has been introduced this Congress to reauthorize spending for the health care of 18.2 million veterans. I do not think that any of us want to neglect to fund medical services for veterans uh, if simply because we don't pass the spending authority for these services. Um, would you agree with that? I would agree. And CBO estimates that that's $73.3 billion. Yeah, billion dollars. Okay, it hasn't been reauthorized for the Veterans Health Care Eligibility Reform Act, and uh, that's the largest of all of them. And I thank you for that. I do have one other question, and I wanted to get all the witnesses to ask about it, uh, to answer on it. We've been discussing the broken reauthorization process, but we've yet to hit on the broken appropriations process. It has been 22 years since Congress last passed all 12 regular appropriations bills on time. When the appropriations process breaks down, the government shuts down. I've been working hard with my colleague, Senator James Lankford from Oklahoma to pass the Prevent Government Shutdowns Act, which implements an automatic continuing resolution when Congress fails to pass the regular appropriations bills and ensures that members stay in Washington to get an appropriations package passed by restricting their travel. It simply says, we can't go home. And neither can our staff, by the way. Nobody can travel. As we consider how to conduct better oversight of federal programs, it is imperative that we work to consider, debate, and vote on every single appropriations bill. To that end, uh, and I realize I'm just about out of time for each of our panelists, how can we ensure that Congress carefully considers each appropriation bill as it used to? And if you could just briefly give an idea or two, and then we can follow up with you in writing. Sure. I think uh, your proposal actually speaks to the personal incentives. I mean, that's a hammer. Uh, that would change behavior. And the second thing is I think the current appropriations calendar as laid out in the 74 Budget Act is, is undoable. Government's too big. It's too complicated to ram everything through in that short amount of time. Okay. Thank you. And you think that's fixed by a two-year program or biennial? It could be fixed by a two-year biennial program, but you have to make sure they actually do the work and they don't save everything to the last minute. Right. Right. Yeah, I think a two-year biennial can be uh, useful, uh, I mean, depending on the agency uh, or, or the type of spending that we're talking about. It may not be appropriate for some. There may be some departments that you may want a, long, a longer period. But my concern is that, um, you know, when we've had instances where we've, um, if you will, gotten spending under control or addressed our debt or had sort of, um, uh, you know, deals that have addressed the debt, they've oftentimes come out of some of these conflicts that we've had. Uh, and so there's this, this strange situation where, on the one hand, none of us necessarily want the government to shut down or want to face these sort of controversial moments. 
But the reality has also been that it's been those moments that have actually given us some of the, uh, some of the mechanisms by which we have actually uh, addressed our, our spending and debt. So um, I am, I am, my personal view is that I think all, all of these solutions should be on the table, but I would be a little hesitant about uh, having fewer discussions about uh, spending restraint and, and uh, our growth in debt than, than we currently have. Thank you. So I'll get back to the point. Uh, if you look at the budget, about 10 percent of the budget is relatively controllable from year to year, okay? If you take into account mandatory programs, of course, you can get rid of Medicare, Medicaid, and some other programs, but it's unlikely. And net interest and long-term contracts, the long-term contract for the Air Force tanker with, with Boeing of $41 billion, if you cut it off, you'll get sued for more than the $41 billion, probably. All of those add up to 90 percent of the budget. So if, if every two years you were really focusing on that 10 percent, uh, I think you could make some, uh, uh, you can uh, make some progress in terms of dealing with unauthorized programs. But I think it's ridiculous that we haven't authorized uh, programs uh, for the veterans, mm -hmm. for the 9-11 Commission, for NASA. I mean, Americans would be uh, shocked if they knew about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me go over. Thank you, and I hope we can uh, maybe get together. This is just a comparison of the two bills, and if there is some kind of hammer we could agree to, the only thing I would say about a hammer is even if the hammer were a freeze for something that you wanted, I think there'd be enough incentive by those who want it not to be frozen that we'd actually bring it up. Well, and, and one of our, you know, part of the shutdown bill that uh, Senator Langford and I have uh, provides for level spending while we're being required to stay here in D.C. and hammer out actual appropriations. So it doesn't allow for a cut, which is what some people on your side of the aisle want, but some people on my side of the aisle would want an automatic increase, hmm. and it doesn't do either right. of those things. It just keeps it level. So I look forward to continuing to work with you on this. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our panel for uh, looking at this, and I think the problem is bigger than just authorization because we mentioned the Budget Act and we mentioned so many rules that we have that we just ignore. and. Uh, how do you force people to ignore rules who ignore rules? Maybe you get better people. Uh, you know, that's part of it. So part of it's the electoral process. Um, but it seems to go on and on decade after decade. And the, the budget is probably the most noticeable, how many times we've breached that and how now it's stuck in the bills. And it's a privileged vote that you can bring up. And I brought up the privileged vote uh, on the, pay, the PAYGO that uh, we brought it up. And I think the last time I brought it up that we had exceeded and we didn't adhere to the PAYGO rules. I got eight votes in favor of enforcing the PAYGO. But we've exceeded it so much that it would have probably been hundreds of billions of dollars they would have had to cut because they just are, uh, they are uh, completely exceeding and ignoring all of the rules. Um, I want to thank the panel for coming today. Keep working on this project. Keep in touch with us. If you have specific suggestions on either my legislation or uh, Representative McMorris Rogers' legislation, let us know. Uh, we'll continue to work with the, the other side to see if there is, there has to be an enforcement mechanism. If there is no enforcement mechanism, I agree we should encourage leadership, but that's sort of, you know, they don't, they don't listen a lot of times. And so, even so. Even so, the the the, pro the problem is is that there's also a built-in incentive. You mentioned it briefly. When we don't do appropriation bills, all the power focuses on one or two people up here. So there ends up being a deal between the majority leader, the minority leader, and the president. So three people get involved, and at that point in time, there are special things that go into bills, but they only happen between those three people. So not only are the appropriators cut out, all the non-appropriate, everybody's cut out, and it becomes a, a Congress of three people at that point. And you don't know what's in it until it's too late. Yeah, it's two or 3,000 pages, and we get it that morning. I mean, there's, yeah. there, there are all kinds of problems here. Um, but I think it's not, we, we should continue to explore them and explore the solutions, and I don't think they necessarily have to be partisan. And I'll work together with Senator Hassan and see if we can come up with some solutions. But we appreciate your input. Thank you for, Thank having you for coming. Right. Thanks. Thanks.